Hello, everyone, and welcome to Time to, Time to Shine, the podcast. I'm Justin. And I'm Karina. And today we're going to actually address some of our viewers' questions. We had a viewer that asked a very particular question. Should we eat food in the sanctuary? Yeah. Well, we had a couple of other of other um, inputs as we asked uh, our viewers some of the topics that they would like to um, to have us uh, um, do. So we did have one that asked us about um, eating in the sanctuary. Now, if you guys are curious about an, any other random topic and you want to know what the Bible actually has to say about that, then feel free to comment on our videos or reach us out on our Facebook pages and we'll address it yeah. in one of our podcast episodes. But in order for us to be able to touch on this topic, we need to go a little deeper than that specific question. Yeah. And what we're going to actually focus primarily on in this episode are two things. The Sabbath rest. And reverence. And reverence, yeah. So that will kind of touch base with the question of uh, our viewer. Are you ready? Um, I actually have a quote here that I uh, wrote down. I wanted to start off with. It says, most Christians will say yes to fear and respect God. But do they do so with one another? What about the things that represent God, such as pews, carpets, and the church lobby? Many Christians today do not believe that church church facilities need respect. So uh, um, do you want to kind of briefly illustrate what that? Yeah, so when we, we bring up the topic of reverence, immediately we we identify reverence with individuals whether it's reverencing your elders having respect towards elders reverence basically is respect a deep respect right so we'll link it with people either having a deep respect or reverence for your elders or whether it be for the spouse or for god okay and that's how we connect reverence but we never or for the most part people don't connect that with materialistic things that belong to individuals so for example let's say um we invite people over to our house right and or let, let's let's use us instead of putting other people in in that sphere let's let's use us we're invited to someone's house and we want to be respectful of them so when we go to their house, are we going to just like let our kids fool around or, you know, just be careless with with their things, start opening their fridge, jumping on the couch, you know, scratching the walls? Are we going to do those kinds of things? Yeah. No, we're not. We're not going to do those no, things. No, no, I mean, yeah. No, no, right? we're not, obviously. <laughs> I would hope not. I'm here <laughs> no, thinking sorry. that, what no, are you I talking mean, yeah, about? Yeah, that's, that's where you're going at. Yeah, so, so in a sense... As we go there, because we respect them, we're also going to respect their belongings. Yeah, there's boundaries, right? Yeah, there's certain things that we won't do because those things don't belong to us. Yeah. They belong to the, the people that we're visiting. So as much as we care about them, we should also care about the things that belong to them. Right? So the same thing goes with God and his house. Yeah. With the sanctuary. It's not our sanctuary. The sanctuary is God's dwelling place where, yeah. where God come where we go to meet with God so whatever it might be that's within the sanctuary we need to identify those things as if or have the same amount of respect towards the things that belong to God as we have with God so if we're going to respect God we also need to respect his belongings yeah. now remembering that people belong to god as well yeah we're called his children so we need to respect individuals and many people go into church and that's as far as they go okay we need to love each other respect each other but then we don't respect the belongings to god the other things such as the pews such as the carpets yeah. and these these things seem insignificant right well it's just it's a carpet it's material things yeah who who really cares but yeah. at the end of the day 
Like, I, I remember there's a lot of times where our kids sometimes when the service goes a little longer, they we sometimes bring like a little coloring book or something for the kids to be quiet during the, the sermon segment of of the service. And sometimes with the little crayons, some of those little wrappers around the crayons, they kind of peel off yeah. to get deeper into the crayon. And the little mess stays on the floor on the carpet. Well, should we just let them leave that there and let the caretaker come and clean it? Or should we have enough respect for God's house to pick up uh, pick up after the mess yeah. that our children made, right? Yeah, that makes sense. It, it would only make sense to do that. So that's, in a sense, having reverence for the house of God. Now, before I touch into, go further and deeper into this topic, why don't you read for us Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30? Uh just so that people don't think that we're pushing one idea, but does the Bible actually talk about this? Okay, so it says, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So, so there you go. The Bible, it's not something that's just coming out of our mouths, yeah. but it's coming straight from the Bible. The Bible says to reverence the sanctuary, which means that have respect for the materialistic yeah. things that are placed in the house of God. We need to... We need to care for those things. We need to, um, in a sense, like treat them as if they they were our own belongings. Yeah. We're not gonna, we're not going to just leave a mess around in our own house. Well, I remember when we um, when the kids were little. Remember we had issues because we had people bring them food. I don't want to obviously call out these people, but they would bring treats to our kids and. You know, because they were small, they obviously, you know, they were always like, um, they were quiet, but in a way of like, okay, let's just give them more a gum or gummy bears or whatever it may may had been at the time. We always, you know, before studying this, I think we we always knew that eating inside the center was something that we didn't want our kids to to have that habit, and they would see other kids and sometimes um, from our own family they would also you know have their kids eating, and our kids would be looking at them and were like explaining to our kids why it is important not to eat in the sanctuary, and so we had a lot of issues, and we tried to explain to them, but I think at the time it was. They, they, they saw it as it's, oh, it's just, you know, it's just a little thing, but they didn't yeah. understand the whole uh, um, aspect of the importance of having reverence in the sanctuary. So, so there's two reasons, two things, and I already mentioned them, but let's say when we do eat in the sanctuary or for the most part, grownups aren't going to do that unless they're chewing gum. And you'd, that's, that's a whole other thing be that surprised. I, I've seen and <laughs> yeah. You know, everyone has their reasons for chewing gum. Yeah. But let, let's focus on, for the most part, eating, it'll be kids. Yeah, yeah. If you're, they're eating, they're snacking or whatever it might be. One, that's a big disrespect to, towards God. Imagine, yeah. l- let's just be practical here. Imagine you go to a courtroom, right? And you're, you're being presented in front of the judge for, for whatever the issue is. Right. And you know how when you're in a courtroom, I don't know. Have you ever been in a courtroom? Yes, I have. Okay. I've been in a courtroom several times. Yeah. (laughs) Driving tickets and things like that. Okay. Anyways, so when you're in the courtroom, you have to be very quiet. When the judge enters, everyone has to stand. When he sits, you sit down and you stay quiet until it's your turn to be addressed. And when you're permitted to speak, you speak. When you're not permitted, you don't speak. Everyone has to take their hat off. You're not allowed to have your hat on in the courtroom. So there's. A lot of uh, forms of respect that you need to follow, ab- abide by in the courtroom. Now imagine you were in the courtroom and the judge is, is there and then all of a sudden you pull out a bag of chips and you like yeah. break it open and you're you know, crunching those chips. How irritating would that yeah. be to the judge to be able to focus, to be able to do his job properly? And it's, it's a major disrespect. It's almost as though you're saying, I don't value yeah. what you're saying or, or your judgment or, or anything that you're doing. And this is irrelevant or unimportant to me. I'm just waiting for the time to pass so I could go back to do my own thing. Yeah. So when we eat, in a sense, it's such a major disrespect to God because we're almost just trying to pass time and preoccupy ourselves with something other than listening to what God wants to tell us. 
But I also find that, you know, the comparison that you're talking about the courtroom and the judge and all that, we know that in this in this time and age that the generation has more respect for men than God himself. So when they, you know, think that it's okay to eat in the sanctuary, it's the lack of respect and the lack of, you know, reverence they have for God himself, opposed to the courtroom, as you were saying, right? Yeah, and we're going to we're gonna get to reverencing God and what that really means. But, like, I don't want to just touch on the one thing of, like, eating. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big disrespect towards God. Not to mention that as you're eating, you're making crumbs on the floor. Yeah. So the mess factors in also so it's that all distractions also, around distractions you. Yeah, that, just... that also goes with like respecting the the materialistic things that yeah. belong to him right it the bible doesn't just say reverence god but it says reverence his sanctuary yeah so we need to have a respect for that so there's a good thing that was established in churches many churches have this uh aspect and it's trying to cater to you know some people have certain needs right so there's this what at least in our church they they call it like the mother's room where some mothers need a breastfeed yeah and in not in order for people not to be distracted or you know attention being drawn to that they go to the mother's room well that's a whole other story because breastfeeding in the actual sanctuary is just it's very very uh rude because you have people that don't cover themselves it's just they just pull it out and it's just there that's just to me that's just a whole other yeah so like people would say this is this is natural this is you know how god designed things to be and everything that aspect is natural but you have to cover up but at the same time you're not in your own home no you're not in the privacy of your own home you're in public places and in the same way god desired and designed humanity to be covered yeah to be respectful of others is the same intent when it comes to breastfeeding in the sanctuary exactly so mothers should go to somewhere more secluded well that's why we have the mother's room that way there's no temptation towards men exactly there's no distractions with other people and you're not drawing attention away from god towards yourself that's why we have the mother's room yes but what's taking place nowadays and this falls under the category of reverence and this uh, topic of reverence is so broad yeah so broad that so many people just don't even realize that they're being irreverent towards God or towards the sanctuary. When we talk about like the mother's room, um, what we've noticed, and we actually had to have a conversation between us about it because when you had our first kid, you were you were going there. Um, by the time it got to our second kid, other younger families started having children also, and it started to become like this crowded place. And what started taking place that you noticed is it started turning into a gossip room yeah instead of just do your thing so that you can go back into the sanctuary and listen to the message of god so that's also another major lack of reverence for towards god where you know you're you're in the building but not really in the building you're you're physically there but not spiritually or mentally there so why bother being there yeah right god doesn't want dead bodies in his in the sanctuary to just speak to dead dead bodies he wants people that are alive people that are wanting to have a relationship with him and then some people are going to question in the end when they said oh god i did this in your name i did that and he's going to turn to them and say i never knew you you were never really there for me yeah right so in order to avoid these things let's address the issue of reverence because it's it's these small things that build up that make an impact when the bigger thing issues come so another another couple of things that I'll just mention quickly that are a lack of reverence for towards the sanctuary is when you have a lot of conversation going on. I read a book uh, not too long ago that spoke about how when we enter into the sanctuary, one of the first things that we should be doing as the children of God is we should go down on our knees and pray, invite the Holy Spirit to enter into our hearts, to allow us to have the right um composure and to have the right mindset to prepare us to receive god into our mm-hmm. lives most people nowadays i don't see doing that and i read that in a book and it just reminded me a lot of when i was a very young child 
I would go into church and I'd see all the elderly people as they come in one Pray. by one. Yeah. They'd go down on their knees. They'd have a silent prayer and then they'd get up and, you know, yeah. sit in their position and wait for the service to begin. You don't see that nowadays because no. nowadays reverence has been blown right out the window. Yeah. And this is why we get the issues that we get in churches where kids are running in churches. Grown-ups are having conversations separate from whether it's a Bible study conversation, whether it's a sermon going on. They're having their own little conversations and you're hearing different conversations all over the place, which is a, a big distraction. How do we think, how can we imagine God to come into the sanctuary and communicate with us when there's so much other things going on around us? Yeah. So, so there's that, there's running, there's all kinds of like dancing and loud music and noise that's taking place. This, the Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't, how would I say it? Isn't, um, dwell? Dwell? doesn't, yeah, doesn't, doesn't dwell in that kind of atmosphere. Yeah, no. Like I can remember the story of, uh, Elijah when, you know, he was up in the cave and then, you know, God was trying to communicate with him and there was fire that passed. There was wind that passed. There was thundering noise that passed and then it was all of a sudden silent and he recognized that God was in the silence. Yeah. Right. So if we want God to abide in our churches, to be able to receive the Holy Spirit and uh, connect with God in a deeper spiritual manner, which is what we're called to do on the Sabbath, to connect with God and separate from everything else, then the only time that God's presence comes down is in the silence the silence yeah which means that we need to demonstrate a form of reverence internally and externally internally meaning our mind clear our mind of everything and externally leave all distractions aside put away all distractions so that we can stay focused on god so that god can present himself before us and share what he wants us to learn yeah so these are different forms of reverencing the sanctuary now God doesn't just call us to reverence the sanctuary. Like I mentioned, reverence is so broad. Yeah, so broad. There's a right? lot to... So I want to read base. Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, and we'll touch on this, this, uh, this verse here. See what else God calls us to reverence. The Bible says this, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. So the Bible uses this word fear, fear. synonymously yeah. as, as a term of reverence. Uh, we could look back on, uh, well, there's so many different scriptures. Fear one God that and comes, give glory to yeah, him. Yeah, that one comes to my head right away in come, Revelation yeah. chapter 14. It doesn't mean be afraid of God, but it really fear, means uh, have reverence. reverence have sorry, reverence yeah. towards God, right? But this is actually saying have reverence or respect the name of God. So many people just, you know, throw out God's name in vain. Yeah, I think that the the whole, oh my God, like I just, I don't want to like address that to the person when the person talks like that, but I just find that, remind you, many people don't understand, you know, they just think, oh my God, but not using God as like actual God. But the, oh my God is something that I used to use a lot. And then obviously once I came to understand it, it was like, okay, like that's just like you're calling God all the time. And it's like God is saying, okay, what is it? But then you're not actually calling God himself. You're using that as like what a metaphor you would say? Yeah, something like that. And it's, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's, it's. I find it's, it very annoying when adults do it, but more annoying when little children actually do it well if kids are doing it it's only it. because they're picking yeah. it up from someone yeah. else right and we had to cut that off because it was something that um it was just not right to be saying oh my god oh my god i love this or oh my god this it's just it's it's a lack of reverence towards god because let's be realistic if we're addressing the name of god but we're not including him in it, or he has absolutely nothing to do with whatever that conversation might be, Yeah. then why are we bringing his name out? Yeah. It, it sounds very foolish for you to say, oh my Justin. I remember. Like your, I re it makes no <laughs> sense. So why are we saying something that makes no sense? No, I remember at the time, I don't know when it was, and he was trying to explain to our, to our 
kids, but I think at the time it was our son. And you you said that, like, how would you always call his name? And then I think he kind of clicked because of how you were explaining it to him. And it made sense. So obviously, because they're like sponges, he understood right away that, yeah. you know, when you say, oh, my God, you're actually calling God's name. But what what for? Right. The, the problem is that that becomes a trickle effect because yeah. one person hears one person say it. And if you hang around that person enough. Uh, yeah. You are, you who, are who, who you hang, hang around out. with. Yeah, that phrase, whatever <laughs> yes, it is, yes. right? And it's true. Let me tell you, it's true. So the more you associate yeah. with people that are neglecting God but using His name completely out of context, all of a sudden you start seeing it. Yeah, without even realizing it. Right, and we have to remember that God isn't just another human being. So God has become some thing else in the church so it's like we have god that's addressed in many ways so i have here like oh my best friend yeah or the man upstairs uh i mean you have a lot of people saying oh you know the man upstairs is watching and you know i have friends that that say that and at the same time i do want to call that out but i mean is it right to call that out like so people. in a in a sense, I understand what people are trying. At least with um, like, I I I've seen in the past. Jesus is my best friend, like T-shirts, yeah, yeah. right? Like those kind of logo stuff and things like that. And I I get it that you know people want to show or you know relate Express to others that they people, Jesus yeah. is a friend because the Bible does say that Jesus wants to be our friend. But to just uh, you know casually say that. Oh, Jesus is my BFF, or we're 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 pals, or we're buds, yeah. or, or things. It no, when Be- the Bible says He wants to be our friends, that's the- it, it's not the same type of friendship that we yeah. have with people here on earth that no. we associate with. I think it's the, like the walk we have. It's with it's God. not this casual yeah. attitude that we should be having with God or with Jesus or or anything like that. Because if you think about it, like. We have two fathers. We have the Father in heaven. We have the Father on earth. So we're not going to call, you know, I'm not going to call my father a friend or, you know, you're my best friend, which obviously, you know, it's, I'm kind of like just illustrating in a way of saying, you know, our father in heaven is our father and our father here on earth. We should have respect more with our father in heaven than our father here on earth, obviously. But it's that that comparison. Like you're not going to treat your father as your best friend in that way. Like you have yeah. respect, you have respect for your father, even though you obviously call your father by his name. So, so it, I, it goes like this. Um, just to kind of try and explain what you're trying to get to. Uh, with people, we have this tendency to make nicknames for yeah. each other. And those nicknames are very intimate and personal. Yeah. So whatever you would, for the most part, sometimes, you know, it's general. But for the most part, it's intimate and personal. And um, in order for us to be able to have, like, let's say a nickname with God, we need an intimate, personal relationship with Him. And once we get a personal, intimate relationship with God, then what it actually does is it, God teaches us that we need to hold him at a higher standard than this world. world. So automatically he's going to cut off the desire for nicknames, for nicknaming him because he doesn't want us to bring him down to our level, but he wants to bring us to his level. So nicknaming is going to be cut off. So when we're nicknaming God in a sense, we're having no reverence for God and nicknames only come because you have an intimate connection. So, if I'm nicknaming God, what I'm really doing, what I'm really saying is I have no relationship with God. And I'm creating my own God, this my own uh, persona of who I want God to be and not who God really is. Because if I were to understand who God really is, we then he that, would bring me yeah. up to his standard and not me bring him down. And we wouldn't also have that... Um... Oh, how am I going to say? We wouldn't also have that lack of respect of calling him, you know, other than my father yeah. or God or Jesus, right? So I, I want to go into the Bible again because, you know, all of these different topics, people could interpret them as 
you know, these are our views or our personal interpretations, but I want, I want to go to the Bible so that people know, our viewers know that we're not just making things up, that the Bible does talk about these things. So I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, and get a context out of this verse, see what this verse is teaching us. The Bible says this, Honor all men, love thy brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Do you want to explain this or do you want me to explain it? I think that, that, can you read it again? So it says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So it was just like what we were talking about. So you see in this verse how it gives different categories. Yeah. The Bible says in Ten, Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. Yeah. Right? So it's saying honor people, love people. Honor even the highest authority of people, meaning like the king, the highest authority, honor them. But it doesn't say honor God. It says fear, fear. God. Yeah. It separates God with everyone else. So what we're supposed to do with God is different than how we're supposed to be with people. Yeah. We honor people, but we have a deeper respect for God. That's why we're supposed to reverence God. We don't reverence people. We have a respect for people, but that respect doesn't surpass the respect we have for God. Because then if it surpasses the respect for God, then what we're actually doing is we're putting them in the place of God. Yeah. And we're turning people into idols. And we see this all the time with celebrities, right? Yeah. A lot of TV actors or musicians or whatever it might be. And people go to these concerts or they might see them crossing the streets. Like if you're in one of those places like... Uh, where does celebrity say like California and the red carpet? Ho Hollywood? Yeah, the, those those kinds of things. And if you come across a celebrity and people just go all like, yeah, they yeah. they become all like crazy yeah. over these people, and it's like they're 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 fearing them. They're they're reverencing these people above God. But the Bible says that it's like an idol. We need to have a distinct yeah. difference between people, whether they be low or whether they be exalted people in high levels. Even the exalted people need to be at a different standard than God. Absolutely. So when we understand that, then all of this stuff Makes sense. gets put yeah. into the right so, thing. So we're saying about like reverence, the, uh, the, the rest and the reverence. So, and we're talking about the sanctuary, the sanctuary, but that does not necessarily mean you should just have reverence in the sanctuary. That, I think that could be another topic how we should have reverence at, at, no matter where we are. Yeah, because reverence, it's something that it's, it's not just something you do when you go somewhere. It's reverence is a lifestyle. lifestyle yeah. It's a habit. It's a yeah. routine. It's a characteristic that comes out of you. Because I see like many people, um, so they, you know, the Sabbath day, they go to church, they, they do what they have to do. And then once they leave, it's like, that's it. So I think that's another topic for another episode because reverence is not just in the sanctuary and just on the Sabbath day. Well, we'll see how far we go with, with this topic. I know yeah. uh, in my personal channel, I'm, uh, I'm working on developing a series on reverence. I actually already have it. I just haven't put out the recordings because this topic, like I said, it is so, it is so broad. And, it's broad, yeah. And just... when I understand the, the need for preparing people for the end times, the first thing that we need to do as a people is to have reverence, reverence for God. Yeah. If we don't pass that first step, we won't make it to the second step and the next step. And then when the final test comes. So in order for us to advance as Christians, we need to begin in reverence. So, so I'll, I, we'll, get to, we'll get to there. But in I, order to reverence <laughs> God. I have a question. Am I able to ask you? Go ahead. So the question I have here is, how can I remind myself that the Bible is extremely special and important? And before you answer this question... Well, can I just give a quick, quick <laughs> yeah, comment? Because I, I know you have another book there, Education, that you want to read a quote to help you with, with that question. No, but this has to do with the question that I'm asking you. Okay, so then go ahead. Go so, ahead. so to remind myself how the, how the Bible is extremely special and important, I remember... I, I don't remember when, but I know that there'd be a lot of times where I'd grab my Bible and I'd set it on the side and then I'd grab like another book and I'd put it on top. And then I'd have, obviously my husband here, he'd be like, oh, please don't put any other book on top of the Bible because the Bible is holy. And it just like, at first it didn't really click to me, 
Like it didn't click and I was like, okay, okay, I won't do that. So as time went by, every time I would um, get my Bible and read it and put it back and then I had another book on the side, even though it was, you know, obviously a um, another book of, you know, let's say like a devotion. I would kind of like put it and then as soon as I put it on top, that little voice, which was his little voice, would come well, into my not, head. it's not necessarily my voice. That's the Holy was, Spirit well, trying yeah, to speak but it was to, a to reminder. remind you. It was yeah, a reminder. Yeah. I was like, oh, I got it. Like, you know, and it, it just makes sense because it is a holy book. Well, in, when it comes to reverence, right? We got to we got to be consistent about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because some people will be extreme and like be so focused on you're not allowed to eat in in the church and we've been to churches where they're very like old fashioned and they'll they'll point it out to you and they'll yell at you for for doing one thing wrong, but then you look at their life and there's all forms of irreverence in their life in different areas. In different aspects of their so areas, yeah. So whether it's one thing or another thing like you were mentioning it shouldn't just be in the sanctuary. Yeah. Reverence is something that has to be a lifestyle, a habit yeah. that goes throughout the week, that goes everywhere you go, it goes. So like the Bible, if we're going to reverence the things of God, the Bible is one of those things. Yeah. Right. So if we want to be consistent, we got to hold a higher standard to the Bible than anything else. So, so what am I saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not telling anyone to do what I do specifically. But when I view reverence, and I've been doing this for many, many years now, all right, I, I put a very high standard on the Bible. And that's why I never put anything on top of the Bible. And I, I taught you the importance of that, right? Um, everyone likes to do their notes and studies in different ways. I know a lot of people that like to use highlighters. A lot of people like to use pens or, or all these different types of things. For me... And I'm not saying whether those things are right or wrong or one of these things are going to, you know, make you not go to heaven or something. That's not what I'm saying. But personally, my my understanding of reverence, like I cherish th this book so much that I don't want to permanently stain the Bible. Yeah. But I think so, so when I fine. when I do want to take notes, pencil. if I ever do take notes, I will always use a light pencil. Pencil, yeah. To, to do light markings. Because even in that, I understand that my ideas, my thoughts might change. And I'm not going to permanently mark what God intended to be inspired and holy. Yeah, that makes right? sense. Right, so I'm having so much reverence that even my studies might not be completely accurate if I'm like jotting down a note or something that I think that I don't want to make that permanent. So I'm going to write with pencil in case God inspires me that I'm going in the wrong direction. Yeah. I need to correct my views. So when it comes to the Bible, I only use pencil. Yeah. I've done it for over 20 years now. And the point gets across that, you know, what I if I go to my Bible and I need I even here on this very page, I have some some pencil markings and the point gets across. I know where my my notes are and things like that, what my thoughts were, but it's mine that it's for me personally. Right. And I'm not I'm, it's not that anyone's changing the Bible because they're they're highlighting with with uh, highlighters or with pens or anything like that. I just. I wouldn't mark the Bible in the same way that I mark, that I mark any other book. Any when other I'm studying book, other yeah. books, I'll use a pen, I'll use highlighters, all these different things. But for me, I'm holding the Bible to a higher standard. Yeah. So I'm not marking it in the same way I do with other books. So you could see my Bible and you could see all my other study books, whether it's uh, for spiritual things or whether it's for health things. They're marked very differently than my Bible. Mm, and it's because I, I view the Bible, I hold it to a different standard. And that's having reverence. Um, some other things that uh, when we talk about the Bible and why eating, are we eating during we're studying I think that's a big lack of reverence yeah why though do you know why okay, you I've, put, I've you taught this to you before I've taught you this but let me see if I remember um, yeah, yeah. I think it's like a distraction would that be considered like a distraction and not having like it's again back to the reverence so so there's two reasons why that i i've i've taught and, and this is a long time ago so i'm not expecting you to remember you understand the concept so you don't do it yeah you, you might not remember the the reason why but that's that's fine because you've already you don't you don't fall in that habit right because it made sense so the two reasons are one food is messy yeah your hands get dirty if you're flipping through the pages yeah that's that's yeah. yeah that's not that shouldn't be happening yeah the bible should stay clean and 
if we're eating and touching the Bible, we're creating a mess. We're we're not putting it to God's standard. It's not a holy book to us. Yeah. It's just another book that we like a a novel that we'd read during meal time. It's that's not what it is. Yeah. The other reason why is that when you eat, what happens to your body is that it's it's putting all its effort and energy to consume and break down the food, which means that the mind is trying to multitask. If you're going to read and you're going to eat, the mind is trying to multitask, which means that you won't be able to be receptive of the the promptings or the speakings of the Holy Spirit. So you won't interpret the Bible properly. We won't interpret the Bible properly. And if we're going to read the Bible to interpret it in our own way, then... What's the point in even reading, reading the Bible? The, Bible yeah. the purpose of reading the Bible is to get the message from God, not from ourselves. Another another reason why is that as you're eating, you become tired because of the whole process of the body trying to break down the food, especially if someone overeats. Yeah. So you you'll just you'll look at the pages and they'll make you fall want to fall asleep, and that habit will just. You'll just link that habit with reading the Bible constant all the time. That every time you look at the Bible, it just makes you feel tired. It makes you feel it makes sense. And then yeah. you just don't have that desire to read the Bible because you'll say, "Oh, I don't understand it," or "Yeah, I just my mind just gets so t- well." Why? There's reasons why those things happen, and we never connect those reasons with why we're actually not reading the Bible. But that's one of the reasons why. I also think that you know when we make time. Uh, to spend with God and we're obviously reading the Bible it's it that time is also holy so if you're eating and you're reading that's like that defeats the purpose of having that one-on-one you know with God right yeah so so there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about the Bible and then you could you could read your your book there that the quote from your book that you're reading um my Bible is how many years probably like 15, 20 years old, this one at least. Uh, This Bible I got from my mom when I turned, I believe, either 18 or 19. I I was sort of doing my own thing outside of the church, and I remember it was was a birthday gift that my parents gave to me, and it was just around the time that I was starting to wake up to the reality of what the world has to offer, and I, I was connecting that I don't desire these things, right? So it, it was it was almost like God was using them in that specific time, and they gave me this Bible for my birthday. So I've had this Bible ever since. So it's been a, a lot of years using the same Bible, and my Bible has been used up. So Let's much say. that he's taped it together, I don't know how many times. Yeah, so I've repaired my Bible yeah. <laughs> many times already. The pages are already like, you know, I, I try to be as careful as I can with my I Bible. I know, I know. But I notice, like, as it, one time, as it falls apart, it's it almost feels like a part of my heart is yeah. is getting broken. So I have, I put so much thought, so much, like, worry to try and repair my Bible, fix my Bible, because it's something so important to me, something so precious to me that, I mean, I could, I could go pick up a Bible at any time. I could go to a store and just buy a Bible. Right, but that's not that's not the point to it. The point is that I have so much respect for what's here in this word that it's my connection with God, my personal Bible, that I try and care for it as if you know God Himself were. Yeah, well, that's were there, that's right? How this it is something be, of God. Right? So, so I try and like, even though it's old, try and preserve it as much as I possibly can. But the reason why I'm talking about this is because you see some people that just are so careless with the Bible. They'll just lay it aside everywhere and anywhere and they expect the Bible to be something that's going to, you know, tell them something or communicate with them. And if you don't treat it like something that's significant and important, how, how can you expect to hear God through it? Yeah. Right? How can you expect to hear God through it? So... If we want to to know what God has to say, if we want to, if we believe that God is the one that inspired the Bible, and that as we pick it up, we're going to hear God, we need to treat this book like it's God speaking to us, and not like it's just something else, right? So, so that's what I basically do. Now, 
you can go read your quote okay and so we'll, we'll talk about it so i had a book here it's one again from my favorite author and it's education so it says here uh we should reverence god's word just like you were saying for the printed volume we should show respect never putting it to common uses or handling it carelessly and never should scripture be quoted in a jest or paraphrased to point a a witty saying okay so so that that comment right there is is interesting you know why i hear so often people quoting the bible it's almost like uh for example like how people say oh my god yeah using com- god's name completely out of context that's having a form of irreverence towards god right and we we show that we don't reverence the bible also when we use it out of context so what 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 does that actually mean uh let me think of um okay for example you know how the bible says or G- jesus said in the bible uh uh what, what did he say what was that phrase uh I'll come back to it you. is written man shall not live, live by, by bread, bread alone but by every okay word. so so here's what what that quote would actually mean like I'll, I'll take this verse and explain it let's say someone's really hungry or one of our kids are really hungry right and you make a a simple meal okay but they're really hungry and they want like a fancy king meal and then then you put the plate there maybe it's just or maybe they just have bread and butter like a, a s- simple meal to end the day. And then they're like, man shall not live by bread alone, mom. Come on, I'm oh, okay. hungry. <laughs> you know, it's taking the Bible yeah, that's a and using comparison. it like completely yeah. out of context. Don't use the Bible like in that For sense. their own... Um, For your own benefit. benefit. To, Thank you, yes. Exactly. Yeah. People do that. That's just one, you know, just coming one up with one many. idea. Yeah. Like, the Bible says, thou shalt not live by bread alone. Why are you only giving me bread and butter? I want food, yeah. real food, right? There's a lot of context that people kind of... There's there's a lot. Yeah. You hear it all the time. And sometimes people even say Bible quotes and they don't even realize it's from the Bible. Shows their ignorance to in connection with God, right? So we need to be very careful of that too. In the same way that we shouldn't be saying, oh my God, we shouldn't be quoting Bible verses when we're not Left trying right, to... Yeah. We're not trying to uh, uplift someone spiritually. Yeah. Right. If we're going to use the Bible, it's it's got to be meant to uplift someone spiritually. Well, we have to study it, right? Because yeah. we can study and, and, and put it in our own words, thinking that it is not by like using it in vain. But, you know, it, it's it's a work in progress. Yeah. So so the first scripture that you mentioned in Leviticus, it, it talked about uh, reverencing uh, the sanctuary and the Sabbath and the Sabbath. Yeah. So let's let's get into the Sabbath a little bit now. So what does that was, mean, reverencing the Sabbath? So I would ask you, what should I not be doing on God's holy day? Which we know that it's the Sabbath day because it is literally written in His Word. In the Ten Commandments, it, yeah. it basically breaks it down. Now we know that there are several Christians that follow the Sunday as a Sabbath, and they they take that context from Ephesians chapter, I believe it's two where it says that the 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 commandments of God and the or, the ordinances were abolished. Okay, we're going to right? that, yeah. Um so they they view that, you know, that the 10 commandments were abolished, so now they observe the Sunday which was a resurrection day. However, that context is not biblical because it's in reference it specifically says the ordinances which were the laws of Moses, so the, if, the rituals. So if you're saying that the law was abolished, does that mean that the Ten Commandments were abolished? No, so there were there that. were the ceremonial laws, okay, and then there were the the moral laws, right? So so in a sense, we're not going to be going and buying a lamb and kind of you know yeah. killing it in order to forgive our sins. No, now we don't have to do that no more. Now we just pray directly to to God and Jesus intercedes for us for the forgiveness of our sins. That aspect of the laws that were established by Moses, that we don't observe those anymore. Okay. But it's interesting because most people will say, no, the Ten Commandments were abolished. Yet they observe eight or nine of the Ten Commandments and they specifically neglect the, the ones that are convenient yeah. for them to neglect. 
So Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, uh, basically says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yeah. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Yeah. In it thou shalt not do any work. So when we're talking about what we shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath, in the Ten Commandments, it specifically says that we shouldn't work. And it gives us a, basically a, a timeline of when it's acceptable to work. Six days you have to work. But it's not just any six days. It says the seventh day is set apart as separate. Yeah. Now, we're seeing in society nowadays, um, it hasn't reached North America yet, but it's starting to mingle itself into here. But if you go to Europe and other parts of the world, they've already started changing the calendars. So you'll see the first day of the week being Monday, being Monday. and then the last day of the week being Sunday so that it, it manipulates and it makes people think that Sunday is the seventh day. Yeah. But that hasn't always been. And what's interesting is that when you look at different languages, for example, our language, Portuguese, every single day is, is named as numbers. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. Domingo. Well, not Domingo. Primeiro, segundo. Segunda, terça, terça quarta. quarta I never thought of yeah, that. Yeah, so it's second day, third day, fourth day, yeah. fifth day, sixth yeah. day, then Sabbath. Yeah. That's the direct translation. I believe Spanish, other, Sabado. many of the European yeah. languages are like that. So it says Sunday, and then it says second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, Sabbath. Yeah. So even in, in the languages, you see that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath day, right? So what shouldn't we be doing on Saturday? We shouldn't be working because that's God's holy day, right? There's there's other things that go along with what we shouldn't be doing. But now if we're talking about, okay, we shouldn't work, then how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to, you know, prepare our things? Well, we have there's the a, Friday for preparation, yeah, so where do we get that, that idea of Friday preparation? I want you to read Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. Exodus? Exodus, I... Exodus. Oh, sorry, sorry. Chapter 16. Okay. And verse 23. So I have, it. oh, 23. Sorry, what is it again? Exodus 16, 23. 1623 And he said unto them This is thy which the Lord hath said Tomorrow is the rest Tomorrow's the rest of the holy sabbath unto the Lord Bake thee which ye will bake today and seeth that ye will seeth and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning So this falls on the preparation day yeah, so basically this was like when the children of Israel were in the desert and God was feeding them manna, manna every single day, right? And on on the sixth day, on Friday, God uh, brought A down double, double portion. For, and he yeah. said, every single day, as you collect, collect enough just for the one day. Yeah. If you collect more on the next It'll day, spoil. it's going to spoil. It's going to spoil. But on Friday, I want you to collect a double and I'll preserve it on the on the Sabbath so that you don't have to do that work of going out to prepare the food or to work. Yeah. Work in yeah. a sense. Right. So here we have the, the idea or the introduction that the Bible gives us to a preparation day, which we would view as Friday to prepare ourselves physically as well as spiritually for the Lord's holy day. So we're not working. So we would prepare meals on Friday for the Sabbath. Yeah, we would prepare whether it's to lay out our clothes to go ready for church. We do that on Friday. Um, anything else that would be considered as work? If if I need to fill up the gas tank, I wouldn't do it on Saturday. I would do it on Friday so that on Saturday I don't have to do that type of work. On Saturday, I could just go to church and go to my other uh, things that I need to do. So I'm not doing that. It's a lifestyle. Exactly, lifestyle. Everything that we think we would need to do. We do ahead of time. So I'm going to ask you this question because we have a lot of issues when it comes to what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And obviously, uh, um, you know, people obviously think some, some things are a little, you know, fanatic at this point. But what happens if I have a wedding on that day? Because, I mean, it's a wedding. It's a family wedding. Let's talk about a family wedding. 
So, um, because you're telling me that, you know, we shouldn't work. So if I present myself to a wedding that I'm invited to, and I'm saying that I don't work on that day, but then I have people serving me. I have people, you know, catering to my needs, obviously on that day. So if I'm not working, how am I allowing that person to work for me? If I'm, if I say yeah. I'm not, I am able to work on that day. Okay. So I get what you're saying. Um, in order to answer that, the Bible teaches us that there's two things that we shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. All right. One of them we already talked about is work. Yeah. I shouldn't work. So in, in the Ten Commandments, it also breaks it down that not you, not, not your, your servants, not your maid servants, not even exactly. your cattle, nothing that dwells yeah. within your house, nothing, no one that you're in control of should be doing any form of yeah. work. All right. So there's that. If I'm, if I can control the fact that, um, if I'm in this place, I'm going to cause you to work. Then, then obviously it's it's, it's on me. Yeah. That I'm I'm putting you in a position. However, however, we have to be careful with that, because at the same time, we have to realize and recognize that everyone has a freedom of choice. Yes, it's not because I show up to a place that you're working, you're forced to work, you're choosing to to be at that work setting. So everyone has a freedom of choice. So I'm not necessarily forcing someone or causing someone to work. However, when it comes to that scenario, we need to remember there's two different things that we're not supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. All right. This one won't uh, fall into the work aspect because I'm not working. I'm not forcing someone else to work. They're choosing to work. So in Isaiah 58 verse, um, hold on, I have it here. Isaiah 58 verse 13. I'll read this one just so that I can read it and then understand and explain it to you. This is what the Bible says. It says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasures, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. So here's the other thing that we shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. Finding our own pleasure. Your own pleasures. Yeah. All right. So, so we need to really uh, seek the Holy Spirit to know, am I doing something for, for the pleasure of God on the Sabbath? Or am I doing something for my own gratification or the gratification of others? Because if it's, if it's not uh, God's pleasure, if it's not something that's pleasing to God, then I shouldn't be doing it. Well, many people are offended or... Are... So many people are worried that they're going to offend people. At the same time, we also need to put God first, Above right? Everything, yeah. Seek first the kingdom of God and yeah. his righteousness, which means that Jesus said, if anyone loves brother, mother, sister more than me, they're not worthy of me. Exactly. So if I'm going to be more concerned with offending people than offending God, then I'm not worthy of God. Right? So, so when it comes down to not doing thine own pleasure... Or I'm going to quickly try and explain this so that we can wrap up our study for today. Doing thy own pleasure basically comes down to this. Um, I'll use this for an example. Washing dishes on the Sabbath. Okay? Some people are going to say, no, you guys are a little too crazy. But bear with me. I'm going to explain it. Because in the same context as reverence, we need to be consistent. Yeah. If we're going to be reverent in one area and not turn it into a lifestyle, then what's the point? Right? So to be consistent... If you were to wash dishes on the Sabbath, for you, because you're the homemaker of the house, that's one of your duties, that's part of your work. So for you, it'll feel like while you're on the Sabbath, you're working. Yeah. There's no difference from every other day to Sabbath if you're having to wash dishes, right? So, so I tell you, don't wash the dishes on the Sabbath, but then the dishes pile up and we know that God is a God of order. What do you do? Okay, Jay, why don't you wash the dishes then? Because you know what? It's not part of your work routine. You do something totally different. Do that. But then if I wash the dishes, I'm and while I'm you. washing the dishes, no, listen to this. You, you look at me, and there's many times that I wash the dishes, and you look at me, and you just get pleasure seeing me wash That's dishes. That's what I was saying. It would be, you know, my so pleasure. So my, your work is becoming my pleasure. Me taking over your work is becoming your pleasure. Yeah. So we're not supposed to work, but we're also not to, supposed to do our own pleasure. 
which means that you shouldn't wash the dishes, neither should I wash the dishes because I'm bringing you pleasure yeah. in, in doing the duties that were, were normally yours. Yeah. So we just don't wash dishes on Sabbath. Well, we don't wash them, sometimes but we wash we them either, after sundown. Yeah, We'll wash them after sundown, yeah. or sometimes we'll just get paper plates where we could just throw out yeah. and not accumulate much dishes. So we're trying to avoid certain things that God calls us not to do on the Sabbath yeah. day. Trying to be consistent with it. Because um, that's taking away his time. And I think that's the next point that um, yeah. that I have here. Uh, do you want to... Go ahead and just read our last question so we could wrap so this up. So how do I know if I'm not showing reverence for the Sabbath? So this, this is what we were talking about, the sanctuary. But now I have uh, other um, topics here. Let's just say like if I go on social media on the Sabbath, how would okay, you so address that? Um, so this would be personal, uh, like a personal analysis. So, so for me to evaluate my own life, how am I, am I reverencing the Sabbath or am I not something very practical? Like you're talking about social media to evaluate if I am being reverent for a God's holy day or for a God himself or for the sanctuary, you take your phone, right? And what are you doing on your phone on the Sabbath? Yeah. You could, if you're going to be reverent, what you'll be doing on your phone is you'll go on the Bible app. Maybe you'll go on the app for hymns to follow along in music. Yeah. You'll be doing ministering, whether you're sharing quotes on Facebook or, you know, sharing a message or, or whatever it might be, trying to inspire people on, on social media platforms, right? You'll be doing those types of things. And it's not to say that you're not allowed to be on social media on the Sabbath. No, because you know what? There's a lot of good that could come out of it. Exactly. And there's a lot of good that you can bring to it. But then there's a lot of distractions. Exactly. So so tell us some of those distractions. Facebook. But how is Facebook a distraction? Because when you're scrolling, you know, if, yeah, if you're set on, you know, sharing quotes and stuff like that. And I have experienced that myself. If I'm on there and I'm scrolling, automatically something else comes up. My thoughts automatically shift somewhere opposed to okay it's god's holy day it's no longer and then my mind just shifts somewhere else so yeah for me in general i'm trying to work my best just to stay off my phone on sabbath yeah if you're not going to be connected to god in it yeah. or you're not going to be used by god to um witness through it then you should be avoiding it because the sabbath is meant to be focused on yeah. god yeah another thing is uh radio Oh, yeah. A lot of people listen to radio, whether it's to listen to news or listen to music. Yeah. On the Sabbath, we shouldn't be doing that. No. Because our minds should be concentrated on holy things. Um, now, I'm not saying listening to things in general is bad. We can put spiritual spiritual music on. Yeah. And like for us, we only listen to spiritual music even during the week because it's become such a it's habit. It's become a habit, that yeah. We, we've realized it's not just to do certain things on the Sabbath. And make that day different than all the other days. We want to experience God every day. But we recognize the Sabbath is set apart it's as something day. more special. Yeah. So we put a little more emphasis to make sure that we disconnect from everything else. So there's sometimes I might have to listen to the radio to know uh, for um, traffic or stuff like that going to work. But I'm not I'm not concerned with that on the on Sabbath. The Sabbath day. It's like we were talking about like thy own pleasures where the, the verse says it. It does, you know, obviously I always say common sense, but not many people have common sense mm -hmm. because they don't know that. But it's like if you're going to do something that's going to please you in the end and you're not putting a God, God above everything else, then obviously you're not, it's not the thing you should be doing on a Sabbath. Yeah. So it, that's why I'm saying it's common sense. And if you're going to do it to please other people, then you know what? You're not going to make it because God should be number one in your life when it comes to you know especially the sabbath holy day that's his day and if we don't practice this here on uh, earth then we're not going to be happy in heaven we're not preparing ourselves for heaven yeah so closing thoughts okay closing thoughts what are your closing thoughts that uh, um you know it is it is uh, a lifestyle and not everybody obviously a lot of people might think, oh, it's just too much to give up. But God gave so much for us. He gave his only life. So if that's one thing that we have to work on and be prepared for the kingdom to come and uh, and our family, we should continue witnessing the right way and not, you know, witnessing in the ways that are for our pleasure or for other people, because that's just giving other people, you know, false witnessing. And if we're going to 
witness God. Let's witness God the right way and let's focus the way it should be and not the way our ways. All right, so my closing thoughts, as you were talking, it just brought me to this scripture and I'm going to read it. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died for us. And the reason why he died for us is because we choose constantly to do things our own way. The Bible teaches us the way that God wants us to live. To some people, it might sound strange. To others, it might sound too much. But that doesn't change the fact that God's way is God's way. And if we want the blood of Jesus to cover us and to cleanse us, then we need to choose to follow his way. Yeah. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. But according to his way. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. If you liked it, if you learned something, remember to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel so that the messages can get out and, you know, share it with your friends because there's many people that just don't know or don't understand what God truly desires when it comes to reverence and the Sabbath. And by sharing, you're witnessing of what God is doing here on this earth and you're preparing people for the end times. So I want to thank you for tuning in. Until next time, let's shine the right way. And God bless you all.